Hello, I'm Dr. Paul Bones, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the theoretical link between the built environment and heroin use in rural and urban areas. Um, this is my contact information on the screen. I'll return to my email address at the end of this presentation. Real quickly, I wanted to say thank you for the AMPS conference for having me, and of course, thank you for taking the time to check out this presentation. Okay, so right now we're in the midst of an opioid and heroin epidemic in the United States. Just to give you guys some numbers, this is coming from the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. Um, in 2015, we had 12.5 million people misusing prescription opioids. Um, we had over 800,000 heroin users. We had almost 10,000 people die from opioid overdoses and almost 13,000 people die from heroin overdoses. As you can see from the map, this is something that's affecting every single part of the United States. Uh, of course, this is not the first drug epidemic that we've experienced in the U.S., um, but this is one of the first to primarily involve whites from primarily rural areas. Normally, when we see drug, drug epidemics, we're talking about different locations and different populations. This difference is something that's really dominated the narrative on what is going on with heroin, with researchers and with the media focusing on questions like, why would we see these kinds of problems in these kinds of areas? This is not something that happens over here, and something that happens over there. As a result, the main way that this has been explained is through a self-medication hypothesis. So accordingly, again, if you look at the map, you see where most of this is coming from. Um, these are rural areas. A lot of the work in rural areas is blue collar manual labor. So the explanation goes that what happened was that you have people in these areas, and if you've ever done any kind of blue collar manual labor work, you know that it's something that breaks down the body. It puts a lot of wear and tear on you, and it's very painful. So the explanation has been that, so persons in these areas, uh, their working jobs and their bodies began developing aches, pains, they went to the doctor, and the doctor prescribed them opioids, which are basically like a, a they're a pain, a category of painkiller that's biochemically very similar to heroin. And as they use these drugs to you know, help alleviate the pain that they were feeling, they became addicted. And as they became addicted, um, they realized that basically opioids and heroin are the same thing, uh, except that heroin is much, much cheaper. So this explanation, this has been the dominant explanation, and it's a good explanation. It has a lot of face validity. It makes a lot of intuitive sense. Um, you know, we're talking about rural areas. We're talking about blue collar labor. We're talking about, you know, something that's been used to basically try and mute pain. The question that I have, though, is, is this something that explains all of the cases and truly explains what's going on in these areas? So one of the largest groups where we've seen increases in opioid abuse and heroin abuse has actually been teens and young adults. Um, for example, in 2016, there was a study, there was a story on NPR uh, came, that came out about Cutstown, Pennsylvania. This is a small community outside of Philadelphia. And the story talked about you know, the extent of the issues they were having with opioid and heroin overdoses. So in the schools, they were actually having to keep Narcan, which is a heroin overdose reversal drug in stock, because what was happening was you know, between classes, kids were going into the bathrooms or the cars or wherever. Uh, they were doing heroin, and they were overdosing in class. And the story talked about how Basically, they were the, the extent of the heroin and opioid problem there was so bad that they were having a hard time keeping enough Narcan in stock. So this is something that we're seeing in a lot of areas. We're seeing kids using heroin and kids dying from heroin. Um, my question is, does this fit the self-medication hypothesis? Do we think of you know, teenagers as having been legally prescribed opioids due to the wear and tear of their bodies from their manual labor jobs? Um, in some cases, maybe this is an explanation, but typically these are not populations that we see you know, on painkillers. Um, so part of what I want to talk about today is, you know, what else is going on here? Um, you know, what sort of theoretical things are happening? One of the things that I'm really going to focus on is the commonalities between uh, the heroin epidemic of the 1970s. Now, typically when we think of drug epidemics, we think about the crack epidemic in the 80s and 90s. Um, and the heroin epidemic is actually something that came before, and it came in a lot of the same places. So we're talking about inner cities. We're talking about large metropolitan areas. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, predominantly African-American low-income neighborhoods. So a lot of people have focused on these differences in population and I feel have overlooked a lot of the similarities in terms of correlates and context. So what I'm going to be talking about today is the link between poverty and the built environment and how that then affects wide-scale uh, opioid and heroin epidemics like we're seeing today. 
All right, so if we start with the 1970s, um, one of the things I have to say is that drugs and heroin have always been a part of rural communities, suburban communities, and urban communities. Uh, they've always been, we've always had access to drugs in these places. What we're talking about, though, with some of these major epidemics is not just, you know, a handful of drug use cases. We're talking about these things that sweep up whole communities um, that take a very big toll on, you know, whole neighborhoods, whole areas, communities, towns, etc. So starting with the 1970s, this is where we saw one of the first wide-scale epidemics um, like we're used to thinking about like I said with crack cocaine or like we see today and what happened in the 70s uh, you know the drug epidemic that we had there really was a result of a number of social changes and a number of physical changes in the cities so for a long time we considered cities to be sort of the lifeblood of American of the American economy this is the place where manufacturing took place this is where you could come in with some or with some high school education, maybe not even a high school degree, you could get a good blue collar job that could help you buy a house. Um, it was seen as, you know, a lot of the way that we created the middle class. Starting in the 1970s, we started to see a really big change in cities. Um, first, we started to see deindustrialization uh, due to recessions and due to other economic factors. This is where we started to see factories leaving inner cities, leaving you know, the urban environment going either to rural or suburban locations or oftentimes going overseas. Um, at the same time as industry was leaving the inner city, we actually started to see a lot of the populations leave inner cities. So um, first we saw white flight occurring where there had always been segregation in America's cities. Usually there was a black side of town and a white side of town. Um, due to busing and pushback for, to busing and some other policies, what we actually started to see was people leaving the city itself for suburbs or even sometimes for rural to move to the rural locations. Um, at the same time as this, we saw the black middle class due to changes in housing policies actually leaving the inner cities to try and go to suburbs themselves. The sum total of these two things, deindustrialization and the depopulation that we saw of inner cities, really led to resource removal. Um, so what we saw was that you know when these families, uh, these middle class families, these uh, middle class white families, and even working class white families, when they left the cities, they took their tax dollars with them. They took their economic power with them. Um, in a lot of ways, this stripped the things that we needed to keep inner cities going. Um, at the same time, this is also where we started seeing um, a number of housing projects being built. Um, so housing projects uh, with high levels of population concentration. And what this basically did was it made the inner city um, a place where poverty was concentrated at the, the highest level we've ever seen. The picture I have here uh, on the slide is actually from Harlem during the 70s. And this is what a lot of inner cities really looked like at the time. So because all these people left, this, this removed resources from the areas. This also left a lot of decay and disorder in terms of the physical environment. So a lot of cities became these rundown, broken down buildings. Um, there was a lot of just empty lots with buildings that had been completely abandoned or partially abandoned. There was a lot of arson during this time because of the empty buildings. Um, so we actually saw a physical transformation of inner cities that accompanied the social transformation in terms of depopulation and resource removal. So as resources and people left inner cities, what came in to replace them was crime and poverty. So as I said before, there have always been drugs in urban communities, uh, but before this time, really what we were seeing was small scale use uh, by individuals, uh, by small groups. Prior to this time, we had never actually seen a full on epidemic like this that claimed whole communities. As a way of explaining this, we can look to criminology theories uh, that focus on the effect of on the built environment's effect on a wide variety of crimes. Uh, mainly what I want to focus on is broken windows theory, which was put forth by Wilson and Kelling in 1982. Basically what the theorist said uh, was that there are things in the physical environment that we can see that increase or decrease crime. Um, so for Wilson and Kelling, what they focused on was physical and social disorder. Physical disorder refers to uh, things in the built environment that broadcast the vulnerability of a neighborhood. So things like, well, broken windows for one, abandoned buildings, abandoned cars, um, graffiti, litter, things that tell us that there is no one taking care of shared public spaces. If we've ever gone, if you've ever gone to a bad neighborhood, probably the way that you determined that you were in a bad neighborhood was by the way the buildings looked. Um, and this is much the same for people who live in these neighborhoods, that looking around and seeing all this, you know, 
physical decay has an effect on the cultures, it has an effect on individuals. Um, so basically what Wilson Kelling said that these were visual signs of disinvestment and that motivated offenders could pick up on these cues. Um, I'd like to marry this term with another uh, concept, which is social defeat. So social defeat is the idea of it's a widespread loss of hope. So this is a neighborhood level concept where you know, people in an area um, basically decide that, uh, they basically come to the conclusion that there is a lack of opportunity in their area and uh, as a result they give up on you know, trying to do things like fight crime, social control erodes basically. Um, and this is in a lot of ways what we saw happen to inner cities. So if you think about the people living in these neighborhoods, so we're talking about high concentrations of poverty, we're talking about low education, few economic opportunities, um, while at the same time there's a daily visible reminder of this in terms of what's going on with the physical buildings. Um, there's also a reciprocal nature here with these things, where as buildings start to deteriorate, social defeat starts to set in, which then you know, the few people trying to maintain order in an area end up sort of settling into social defeat because they realize that there's no way that they can fight against what's happening to their community. As a result, populations in these areas feel very much cut off from the rest of the world. They feel isolated. And it's actually these exact kind of conditions where you where widespread drug use starts to occur. If things look good, if things are going well, if you have hope and opportunity in your future, then, you know, there's there's no there's reasons not to do drugs is the best way to put it. Uh, on the other hand, if you see nothing but poverty and despair around you, um, this is how we start seeing group activities on things like drug use. This is where we see epidemics actually start to set in. All right, so what do cities in the 1970s have to do with rural areas today? A lot of the reason why it might not make sense to talk about urban and rural areas in the same breath, even if we're dealing with the same social problem, is the way that we've come to think about these two locations and the emplacement or the social meaning that we've given to both of them. We've often thought of urban areas as places of change, crowded places, dirty places, places where crime is more common. On the other hand, we think of rural areas as being these small moral areas as places where you know, our true values, true American values, true Christian values live in rural areas. Um, as a result of this, we've kind of overlooked the similarities that these areas have had for a very long time. If we just want to talk about poverty, uh, looking at urban and rural areas, we see similar levels of poverty concentration. While we might be talking about larger, play, uh, larger dispersal of people in rural areas, uh, we see that these two places are very similar in terms of things like um, low education, high unemployment, high public assistance receipt, uh, high, ch ch high number of children born out of wedlock. Um, on a lot of de demographic poverty indicators, urban and rural areas are, have more in common than they do different. Um, one, of the, one of the differences, though, actually also relates to the built environment, though, because in a lot of rural areas, it's harder to have access to social services is very much more constrained as opposed to in urban areas. So we're talking about we have a lot of population. We have these populations that are suffering from you know the same levels of poverty, but they also have lower levels of access to things that can help them deal with that poverty. Um, so that's the way that rural areas have always been. Um, at the same time, we can talk about changes to the rural environment that in many ways mirror what we saw in urban areas in the 1970s. So as I mentioned before, one of the big things that kicked off the decline of urban areas was uh, globalization and deindustrialization. De um, this is something similar to what we've seen with agriculture, which is in many ways you know, the direct correlate of manufacturing. So for rural areas, they've often been associated depend and depended on agriculture. What we've seen though is you know, a lot of the agricultural products that we consume in the US now come from other countries, such as the banana, the banana that I have on the screen. Um, we've also seen the decline of small farms as they've been replaced by large agribusinesses. So it's gotten harder and harder for you know, your average American farmer, you know, sort of the image that you get in your head when you think of rural areas to get by. Um, and as a result of this, we're actually seeing things like depopulation and disadvantage increasing in rural areas, much like they did in urban areas. Um, a number of people, young people, don't really want to live in 
isolated rural communities anymore. Um, so they're leaving and there's no one really moving into rural areas to take their places. Um, so as a result of this, uh, if we look at rural areas, they've always had physical distance from suburbs and from inner cities. Um, what we're seeing though is an increase in the social distance between rural areas and other locations, um, something I want to talk about here in a minute. As I said earlier, uh, one of the most common ways that we identify when we're in a vulnerable neighborhood is the way that it looks and the state of the buildings. Um, so here on the slide, I have two different examples of things that are actually very common in rural areas. Um, if you've ever taken a drive through rural America, you'll note a number of abandoned farm buildings. Um, you'll also may note a number of abandoned factories, mines, warehouses, etc. Um, on the right hand side, you'll see this is the Nemacoa mine from Nemacoa, Pennsylvania. Um, these kinds of things are very common in rural areas, and in a lot of ways, they serve, serve the same functions that they do in inner cities. Uh, as you start seeing more and more decay and degradation, uh, there's, there's an effect that this can have on you. Um, and because this is actually Although we don't often think of you know, abandoned buildings necessarily in the same way in rural areas, much like we don't think of uh, audible gunshots in rural areas as we do in urban areas, um, these things can still have an effect. If your total environment around you broadcasts nothing but social defeat, um, it has an effect on you. And in a lot of ways, it has the exact same effect that it would in urban centers in terms of reducing social control. So they're actually keeping up with the idea of changes in rural environments. Um, you know, well, like I said, while rural environments have always been physically isolated, we're seeing a lot more social isolation. Uh, if you talk to people from rural areas, uh, for example, this is something that came up during uh, the presidential campaign, that people in rural areas feel like America has forgotten them. They feel like they don't respect them. They feel isolated and disenfranchised. Um, and you know, part of this has to do too with the continuing rural decay as we enter a government that has fewer funds available for infrastructure and for social services, rural communities are often the first ones to lose their funding. This also has to do with the change in the way that we view rural life. Uh, so Lipschitz in 2014 at this conference introduced this concept of rural America as America's dumping ground. So I mentioned that for a long time we've thought of rural locations as sort of like the heart of America where our morals are. But part of what we're seeing is that, you know, that's not in practice how we treat these areas. So if you look at rural areas, this is where you're most likely to find your dumps. Uh, this is where we store and dispose of hazardous materials. This is where we put our prisons. And as Lipschitz talked about that, you know, this is this is the way that we view rural areas and persons in rural areas, they know this. This is something they've internalized. Okay, so what can we say overall about the built environment and at least its theoretical effects on heroin and drug use? So what I would argue is that we need to start focusing on the similarities, not the differences between rural locations and urban locations. When we have the same outcome happening in two areas, Instead of focusing on what explains the difference, we need to focus on what explains the similarity if we want real change in both of these areas. Um, I think the built environment is something we need to focus on because in a lot of ways, it's the thing that we see. It tells us what our future is. It can give us hope or it can give us defeat. Um, as I say here, disorder and social defeat, these are things that are visible in nature and they're mutually reinforcing. The structures that we have in our lives inform our cultures, and from our culture, this is where we decide to act as individuals. The best way I feel like to start addressing some of these issues, some of the social problems of rural areas, in particular the heroin and opioid abuse, is to really focus on those structures, because structures are relative, if we're talking about physical structures, they're relatively easy to change. Um, so like I said, uh, the built environment, I think, is really a good place for a starting intervention. Um, as I mentioned before, rural locations really need a lot of services. Um, unless you're in the county seat, it might, you might not have access to things like healthcare. Um, you might not have the same access to like education and to uh, drug treatment and a lot of other things. So one of the things that we can do is target the need for services. Um, also, at the same time, while I'm advocating for new builds and new investment, a kind of public works for rural areas, we need to make sure that these are local interventions and they're, they're done, they're being led by local populations. Um, we need to preserve the social and cultural ecosystems as much as humanly possible. Um, as a result, you know, every community is going to be a little bit different, but I think that controlled, necessary new builds and renovations are a great place to start with this. And here are my citations. 
And that's it. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. Uh, here's my email address. Please let me know if you have any questions or comments. Thanks again.